lovely to see you all hope you're having a great day um, I hope you enjoy this case this is an older case this is a case of domestic abuse or a survivor of domestic abuse and this is a female abuse against a male victim here another one now this case has to be told it's an older case right and unfortunately the person who I'm talking about has since took his own life right because of the abuse and the lack of being believed I suppose and the struggle to get things done for finance against men within the, you know the household and stuff and so this case it's it's quite sad it's from Calgary it's a Canadian case and um, I, I it's, it's a sad case but there's lots of statistics in here and stuff that may explain to you more one why people sort of abuse in a way um, but more importantly why a lot of male victims don't come forward at all listen this is the Earl Silverman case now Earl he was born um, in July the 4th 1948 so he was an older man and he died in April the 26th 2013 and he was only 64 when he unfortunately took his own life and when we go through this sort of case you see why he decided to do that to himself the struggle that he'd had for years after coming out about the domestic violence that he suffered at the hands of his wife not being believed trying to set up a refuge for men a helpline for men which he funded himself lack of funding and understanding from the government at that time in, in Canada so there was a lot of things that drove him I think to doing that to himself so again you know there are trigger warnings now with this and this and there'll be helplines and stuff up for all sorts of things throughout this case Oh, tried to set up, well he did set up, he didn't try, he did set up this family man society early on, he also, so he was the founder and president actually of the family man society the alternative safe house because we have a lot of stuff for women out there who's abused and in domestic violence situations and stuff but we don't have a lot out there for men even in private homes it's difficult to get funding for men in these sort of situations and believe it some men do need that safe house and so Earl in the early days after his abuse sort of ended he because he couldn't find any help or get any help for himself he set up a lot of this stuff to help others in the same situation as him and there's quite a lot of them he also was part of and set up the men's rights movement now you know we have a lot of things that we talk about it all the time the rights for women the rights for this the right for that but I can say about Claire's law and all these different laws they are there for both right it's not just for women these helplines are there for men and women if they don't specifically have the staff to help you with the man part of it they will refer you on to somebody else very very quickly these charities are very very good and that just because it might say you know and that's why it doesn't say women's domestic abuse this domestic abuse it's domestic abuse or domestic violence right in a home it's it's to do with in violence between a partner and another partner no matter what your sex is no matter what this is for you so you should seek help so also uh, Silverman again he was uh, born at the 4th of July 1948 and died in April 2013 he was a um, Canadian domestic abuse survivor and I'm talking about not just murders on murder analyzed at the minute we're trying to highlight the abuse domestic abuse so we're doing survivor stories as well because people survive it and sometimes even that surviving that part of it can destroy the rest of your life so it's showing you not just what the case is all about but what's the after effects like how it leaves these people how it destroys their lives and it's affected their whole lives it's affected their kids lives and this really affected um, Earl's life throughout really throughout so Earl's story starts I think probably about before 1991 he'd escaped 
domestic abuse in 1991 and this was in this um, uh, Montreal area then he moved to Calgary after that his wife was vicious she was vicious she was what we now call coercive control over him and abusive and violent sadistic she did a lot to him she made him feel absolutely worthless in himself you know quite tortured him really but also again what she would do was the same as skills case that we've just talked about in the last one I'll leave the link below for that when you're a man and you're being abused by a woman at home violently abused and and you having this coercive behavior constantly put on you this controlling behavior then they're saying to you if you go and tell anyone that you won't be believed and I'll say that you did it to me because there's more rights to women because that's what women think right because that's what's out there isn't it but it's not really but I suppose in before 1991 when Earl was going through all this torture within his relationship marital home um, there wasn't any help he did try and seek help he went to the police and they laughed at him they laughed at him you know as if a man could be abused by a woman brushed it off as a joke really she thought he was mad and so but when you're under that sort of pressure in the relationship where you're already struggling to survive in that relationship whether it's through the violence or the control when then you're being laughed at and put down and stigmatized because of it he felt he had nowhere to go so in the end he just left he left the home and that's when he moved I think to Montreal or to Calgary from there he was so violently abused it destroyed him but what destroyed him even more and he said this in his own words is that when he went to find help to get help this is what he had there was no safe houses for him to go there was no refuge for him to go to there was no helpline for him to contact and talk to someone he tried to talk to the police they laughed at him for it was a joke so in his mind he was already victimized once as this abused man in his own home but then he was further victimized in society because no one the government no one there was nothing for this man to turn to so he started to self-fund his own helplines and his own safe houses he used his own house to put people up in men of this in the same predicament he was in and children they had to house because the men would take the children away from the abusive wives because they were so abused themselves they were fearing for the lives of their children so but there was no funding at all he tried to get funding from the government it was no not interested in that time right so this is the early 90s to 2000s right really it was no it hasn't been that many years since some funding and some helplines have been come into force across the world not just in Canada because it really wasn't recognized because we see men as something different don't we the government see men as something different we can't be portraying men as this masculine macho thing but having helplines them because they're being abused by their wives but there's so much that goes into these abuses of when a woman abuses a man there's so much difference in the way that they do it they're just as violent they can be just as violent but then it's more about coercive control as well that controlling behavior but the violence is there don't think it isn't it is it's really there and then these men are threatened with if you say anything about me no one's going to believe you because i'm going to say that you've done it to me and that's how a lot of them get away with it and that's why a lot of men do not come forward and say anything about being physically abused by their partner who happens to be a woman i think in 1992 um oh he um errol he's he founded i think it was the family of men society because it had to be specifically for men because that was only his own experience right and you'll find a lot of these charities or you know not so much the government ones but the single little charities that are run by 
victims or ex-victims like female victims he was a male victim of domestic abuse so all he knew and how to get these men help was to to really give them what he couldn't find himself and it really worked he saved a lot of people but as he continued to fight with the government to try and get this funding and to help him because don't forget he's self-financing now everything himself the pressure on this man must have been tremendous at this point because on one hand you're trying to keep yourself afloat you've got a house you brought that you're trying to use it as a business to help others to have people stay there to feed them to look after them and no funding I think one time only I think it was the late 90s that he actually got a thousand dollars Canadian dollars funding for one man that he had staying there one thousand dollars he'd already spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands and worked to, to support these men himself over these years it took a big toll on his life I think the men's um, alternative safe house was started in the early 2000s and that was his own house in Calgary and it was making it the only private funded shelter for male victim domestic abuse in Canada and it was listed as a safe house abuse for everyone lists the resource and that that really as early as May 2004 so he was still self-funding in 2000 and four and I think the first funding actually was in 2013 and that was for a man and his four children and that was 1,000 Canadian dollars that was it and that was for a four month stay in his house so you can see the tremendous amount of pressure financially mentally you know trying to support this charity and everything else he was doing by himself really with very very little help again in 2013 I think that he knew he couldn't do it anymore and he, he announced then that he was going to close it and that was really through lack of funding and I think that he had given up fighting because he'd fight he'd been fighting all his life in his married life he finally found freedom from that in, in, in 1991 or just before 1991 so for all these years, right up from, from 1991 or 1992 to, 19, uh, to 2013, this man is self-funded and helped so many people, um, domestic violence victims, really, that, and self-done it, you know, everything himself. I think it was just too much for him. And you, you've got to really think about this man in such a positive way and what he's done to open up the awareness of victims of like this, male victims like this of domestic violence. So on April the 26th, 2013, um, he was found hanging from the garage. He'd sold his property about a month before and it was all going through because he couldn't deal with it anymore and that's when he took his own life and the man that brought the house had come to ask for something couldn't get hold of him and come round and found him on that day it's a very sad day to show the truth it was put down to um, apparent suicide because in his will the sale of that house the money from that house went then into his trust for to help people of domestic abuse. When they found the suicide note, which was a four full page, four, four, four full pages of notes, he condemned the government actually for their lack of concern and help and assistance towards victims, male victims of domestic violence. And so you can tell that was one of the reasons why he took it. One, I think he just had enough, really, of the pressure of it. Two, he saw no other way out to fund any more help. So he thought by doing that and leaving the money from his house to this charity, he would be able to help people after he was dead. He wanted 
his death, he says in his four page letter, no left before he died, that he wanted his death to be remembered so people would be aware of what the impact is to males suffering from domestic abuse. I, I th for me personally, I think if he had hung on just a little bit longer, right, he would have seen changes that have that have come in. I don't think anyone should take their own life because you feel you felt so hopeless, and it's a real sad situation when you have a man that tried to help so many that in his real time of need there was no one that would help him or could help him. He didn't reach out, but he expected others to reach out to him, and they did. But if he'd just reached out, I'm sure there would have been people out there that would have assisted him. It's unfortunate, isn't it, that really, like now we do YouTube and we get awareness from social media and stuff like that. 2013, it was around, but it wasn't like it is today. What this man could have achieved, really, if he had had a platform, you know, really, and the support from people. It's a whole different time, isn't it, now? Even though we're talking about, you know, 2013 to 2024, the world has changed. Social media has changed. We can reach so many more people. We can influence so many more people. We can get people more aware of what is out there for them to be helped. And I think if, I think his, it was just timing with him but I think it was where he felt so hopeless. But that really stems back, and he says it in this four-page letter, that he was already damaged from the domestic abuse that he had suffered at the hands of his ex-wife. He was already damaged. He was in further damaged by the way that he felt the society, mm -hmm. police, and everyone else had treated him. So for him, he was already damaged. And it's very, very sad cases. Very, very sad. So his funds from the sale of the house and all his estates that he had, and anything he had, savings, whatever, went into a pot, really. And I think it was spread out, actually, for um, to create an educational scholarship for male victims of female um, predatory domestic abuse or domestic violence. Now, the Supreme Court of Alberta directed that the funds should go be directed to the Mount Royal University Foundation for this purpose. And that's then that they create lots of different things that can help. Also, studies into why males do not come forward as much as females. So he's done a really good thing there. So I think when we talk about violence to men, from this domestic situation only, right? And why they don't come forward. And we spoke about it before and so many times. Men find it a stigma, right? Because they believe they should be something because that's what society teaches them they should be. But any man out there that's suffering from domestic abuse should come forward, right? They should. No one's going to disbelieve you because evidence usually proves it themselves, right? Or just leave. And I know a lot of male victims have children with their partners and don't want to leave them children and are scared that then the wife, the perpetrator, will ring up the police and say, he's a domestic abuser, he's took my children, this, that and the other. I would always say that you need as much evidence. This is for any domestic abuse case, especially where you want to remove children from the home. Um, for their own safety is that you need as much evidence as you can and you need to work with an agency or an organisation to help you to get away from that situation and help you remove them children from that situation as quick as possible. I think there's a lot of helplines out there and you'll see a lot of helplines. I'll also leave some statistics up on some slides at the end so you can see really just how much of this domestic abuse on men is really going on. It's quite shocking really when you think that there's so much hurt and pain going on out there and people are just scared to come forward. You've got nothing to worry about. 
but always document stuff, talk to people, always. That's whether whoever is abusing you. Documentation is always the best. Film it, I don't know what you've got to do with it, but do something, but get help. And if you can get away, if it's safe for you to get away, then get away. But always work with an agency, always work with someone that you trust that can protect you the best way you can. So good luck to everybody and thank you for watching. Till next time, bye bye.